Before we get started, today's sources are Witchcraft and Superstitious Record in the Southwestern District of Scotland by J. Maxwell Wood, and Witchcraft and Second Sight in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland by John Gregerson Campbell, both of which can be found and downloaded as an ebook or otherwise on projectgutenberg.org for free. I highly recommend both these books as well as that website to anyone who would like to learn more about this topic which I have only scratched the surface of. Links for both can be found in the description below. I would also highly recommend Halloween Lore, a collection of folklore by Carolyn Emmerich, which can be found on Amazon. Link is also in the description. It's difficult to look long at the witch trial era without the grim reality of its setting in. These were times of great terror, if not for what was by some estimations millions of people killed in brutal and painful ways for crimes they did not commit, than for the imagined machinations of those disciples of Satan whom European society rallied against with such vigor. The mischievous nature of the witches renders them, to the modern person, rather charming and likable characters when compared with their cool and crazed religious opponents, and for that it is easier to side with them when regarding what I have to present to you today. Let us not, however, forget, when discussing these atrocities on par with the genocide committed by these men of the church, that these were people who lived in great and constant terror of the supernatural, and that for however cruel they were to their victims, the witches were imagined to be far worse. This does not, however, excuse, nor does me mentioning it attempt to minimize the evil that was inflicted on the populace at this time. This aspect of the witches' character, that they are disciples of Satan who have no will other than to cause great harm and evil, is mostly lost in their modern depiction. Witch and Satanist are not generally thought to be synonymous by us anymore. While the witch trial era occurred all over Europe, today we will be focusing on Scotland. In 1563, Mary Queen of Scots decreed, the states enact that no person take upon hand to use any matter of witchcrafts, sorcery, or necromancy, nor give themselves forth to have any such craft or knowledge thereof, also that no person seek any help, response, or consultation at any such users or abusers of witchcraft under the pain of death although I am paraphrasing for obvious reasons. For hundreds of years thereafter, being accused of witchcraft meant nearly certain death. The justice system, for lack of a better word, had means of discerning whether or not the party was guilty. There are ways of telling whether she is a witch. Are they? Oh, well, they tell us! Tell us. Oh. One such method involved the witch's mark. Witches were believed to hold cruel ceremonies whereupon they would, in fire, sacrifice their victims to the devil himself. The process of initiating someone as a witch, hoping to partake in their revelry and orgies, no doubt, involved engulfing them in a similar such flames immediately before dousing them with some sort of potion that kept them from suffering or being harmed as a result. But it would leave scars on their bodies called witches' marks. Passing a needle or other sharp instrument through said mark, and causing no blood drawn or pain felt, was regarded as firm proof that one was a witch. Another important sign of detecting a witch is that early in the morning, on the first Monday of every season, the smoke from their chimney will go against the wind. Perhaps the most common reason for being accused as a witch is simply that a woman who is not so social, and perhaps smarter than their neighbors, would inevitably fall victim to gossip. In many cases, more so than one would think, women would, out of desperation more so than out of being brazen, allow their neighbors to go on thinking that they were witches. They did this because the typical reaction to discovering that your neighbor was a witch was to provide them with food and clothes and similar such resources so that they would not murder or otherwise torment them. Being provided for by their community was at times a fair trade-off for the risk of being burnt at the stake. Witches were, without a doubt, shit disturbers of the highest degree. Some such depictions of their hijinks were rather amusing, such as Skirtsy MacLeg, nicknamed Lucky, a famous witch whose tales were widespread, 
who was said to turn into a cat and walk about on her hind legs like a man just to disturb people. Some of her other favorite pastimes include frightening people by appearing as a naked boy, sucking cows into the shape of a hare, talking with travelers on the road, sending young people into declines, and drowning people by sinking a cup in the yill boat of her kitchen. Whatever a yill boat is, I haven't been able to find, but I would guess that it's some sort of bucket, given that yill is Scots for ale. Cows were, indeed, a common target for the witches. To the modern person, we may not realize the importance of the cow to a farmer in those days, but perhaps a large portion of especially a poor farmer's livelihood would depend on their cow, so naturally there was great anxiety about anything going wrong with the animal. Witches would go about hexing cows to make them stop making milk, or take from their dairy its substance, upon which the cow would cease to create milk of any quality. Substance is translated from Gaelic toroch, but perhaps it doesn't do the word justice. Essentially, dairy is believed to have a sort of quality to it that the witches would take away. Thankfully, there were counter charms to prevent this. If you took whatever was left of the bewitched cow's milk and fill the dish with pins other than boil the milk dry, the effect of which uh, was to hurt the witch severely, as though they were being stabbed by the pins, and it caused them to come out and confess, or at least fix the cow to end the charm. As a result, it was typical of witches to steal all the sharp, sharp objects in the home to prevent said charm. A horseshoe nailed to the milk dish or the front door of a home would also keep of milk its substance, and protect the home from witchcraft. In fact, horses themselves, when fully shod, were said to be safe from witchcraft. Uh, more about counter charms later. Witches were wont to cause great misfortune to anyone who crossed them. One account tells of a man from Kirkmaiden who went out hunting, and upon finding a hare, he fired at it. The hare was utterly unaffected by being shot, so he shot again and again, without effect. Finally, he recognized that the hare was a witch. Silver is harmful to witches, so a typical countermeasure was to load a silver sixpence coin into your rifle. Upon doing this and aiming it at the hare, the hare spoke up and inquired if he would shoot his own mother. Startled, he fled the scene. Upon arriving home, he took to his bed and did not arise for five years. When he awoke, his mother had died. With his strength returned, he attended her funeral. Another similar such story involving a witch as a hare involves a man from the island of Lismore. He was out hunting when he encountered a hare which he fired at. It gave out an unearthly shriek, and then it occurred to him that there were no hares in Lismore. Suspecting it a witch at once, he fired at it a hit sixpence and fled. The next day he heard that a reputed neighborhood witch now had a broken leg. This woman would regularly find him and beat him severely. This would haunt him and prey on his mind, and over the years he became brooding and idle. A perhaps less disturbing story is an account of a shepherd who, on his way out of a church, unwittingly stepped on a frog. As you may guess, this was no ordinary frog, but a witch who had disguised herself as one. The witch, having been seriously injured by the oblivious shepherd, sought revenge. So she followed him for many years, but the shepherd was a pious man of the church, so she could not affect him. One day, however, he forgot to say grace before a meal, and the witch suddenly had power over him. The witch summoned an avalanche that hit their house and killed him and his entire family. The moral of the story is something like, remember to say grace, or perhaps be careful not to step on frogs. Witches as animals is a common trend in their accounts. Animals, especially cats, found in places deemed unnatural were suspected to be witches. Perhaps to the relief of one dairy maid, even a whale could be used as a scapegoat. The lord of a ship once found the milk and butter on his ship to be rather off, and at once he called forth his dairy maid questioning her, and she confessed that a whale had come by the ship, and with its bellow it took away the substance from their butter. The Lord, being an honest and unsuspicious man, accepted this explanation. 
Another tale involves a young man who was going to meet with his lover. On the way, a cormorant began fiercely splashing him with water, so he gave it a proper whack on the back with his cudgel, which is sort of like a small bat, and it flew off. Upon arriving at his destination, the girl's mother met him at the door and told him she didn't know what was wrong and that her daughter had suddenly fallen ill with a very sore back. Knowing at once that she was the cormorant, he told her he didn't want to speak to her or her daughter anymore. She threatened him, but no harm came of it. One day, a man sailing into a harbor with a load of peat noticed a couple rats sailing alongside him. In a feat of poor judgment, he chucked a piece of peat at them. They responded by summoning a storm that nearly wrecked his ship, and he only just recovered. In the highlands of medieval Scotland, even sheep could be witches. One day, a man was walking home from a neighboring village where he had bought a new gun, when a black sheep began to sprint towards him. At once, he loaded his rifle with a sixpence and raised it up to it, but before he shot, the sheep transfigured into a woman he knew. She told him that she would do him no harm if he kept her secret. He did this for years, until one night, drunk at a bar, he dared to tell this story. He was found drowned soon thereafter. There are dozens more stories like this, but I can't go on forever, so this was just a selection of ones that stood out to me. I highly recommend giving those sources in the description a read. It would be a shame to talk about the witches without mentioning the spectacle that is the witches' ride or hollow mass raid. All the witches of the world would, like a swarm of bees, all fly off into the air at midnight and fly about the world in a great gathering. Their mount was not limited to the broomstick. It could also take the form of ragwort, hares, cats, chickens, and sometimes even eggshells. The inefficiency of such vehicle, no doubt, was meant to show off the witch's power. Witches would also ride post a human steed. Riding post is when a person is turned into a gray horse that can apparently fly and is ridden about. Higher-ranking witches flew about on chariots, or on special brooms made from the bones of a dead man, the seat from the leather of a newborn child, which is probably, uh, hopefully, the creepiest thing I'll ever say on this channel, and the iron bolting holding it together forged in the smith of the devil himself. This witch's ride originates from the Wild Hunt, where the Norse gods would fly about the sky on their mounts, and this is the same reason why Santa Claus also flies through the sky on his sleigh and reindeer. Uh, this has led me to wonder if Santa Claus is a witch, but I digress. To this day, there's a tradition in Sweden where on Christmas Eve you hide your brooms so that the witches can't make use of them. I've heard of others in modern times with a fonder view of the witches who have begun leaving their brooms at the hearth for them. Another important aspect of the witch's character is her companion, the familiar. The familiar served the witch as a teacher, partner, and attendant. The source of the witch's power was from their familiar. While the familiar is most often depicted as a black cat, it could be any animal, but animals that were common to the peasantry were typical, such as a dog or toad, the latter being especially powerful. Familiars didn't always, and some insist that they never did, have a body, but were rather incorporeal, hence being called a familiar spirit. The familiar was often also a folkloric creature, such as a fairy or hobgoblin, and could also be a person who had died and now resides in the fairy world, which the Irish call Tir Nanog. There is a muddled concept of the fairy world and the land of the dead in British folklore. Because of the familiar, merely owning a house cat could at times be proof of witchcraft. After writing and recording this video, it's nearly a half hour long, so I've made the decision to split it up into two parts. In the next part, we'll talk about charms and white witchcraft, the counterpart of the evil black witchcraft which I have been discussing in this video. So, sorry to cut it off here, but that will be all for now. The next part should be out shortly. Thank you so much for watching.